time for us to start. Let's hope all the gadgets are working today. No inexplicable, inexplicable cutouts or anything like that. Uh, a few announcements. Lab this week is just counting again. So finish up counting. This should be the last week that you can count. We'll see. Uh, I'm going to be in the lab at the scheduled times. I will be going over your lab reports for experiment number one while I'm in lab. So you can come talk to me about that. And you can come talk to me about the second lab report. So we've got uh, almost 2,000 flies counted so far. I hope we get some more. But it's enough that you should be thinking about doing the analysis, writing up an introduction, and uh, all that other stuff that you can do before the results are finished. And feel free to come talk to me about all that. Uh, another thing is, yes, I was slow, I was tardy, I didn't get your homework assignment up until Sunday, but there is a homework assignment there. Uh, it's a whole bunch of maternal effect problems. So you should go through those. It's due on Thursday. Give you plenty of time. Uh, it's, it's also a little bit, you know, as we get farther and farther into the class, like problems get more and more convoluted and weird and try and pile in a whole bunch of stuff all at once. It's more of that sort of thing. So if you want to ask me questions about that, please do that as well. Either lab or I'll make time on Wednesday if anybody's stuck. I won't tell you the answer, but I can give hints. All right, so uh, I think that covers our thing. Where are we at now? We are talking about developmental genetics. And last time we talked about flies and how flies develop. And we've still got more to talk about about that. So as you recall, a quick summary of last Wednesday's lecture is that uh, Yanni Nuslein Bolhard and Eric Bischhaus did this saturation anyway so they did this saturation mutagenesis study where um, they isolated lots and lots of mutants and in particular they isolated mutants that affected early development they found lethal mutations that affected early development and they also studied those and the whole point was that they worked out the identities of many genes that contribute to early development in the fly. And these were asking kind of fundamental questions like, how does the embryo know which end to make the head, and which is dorsal, and which is ventral? How does the embryo know to make stripes? So how do you make segments in an embryo? And so they worked out the genetics of those processes. And that's where we were. We were going through some of those, and I told you, okay, one is bicoid. Recall bicoid is the one that sets up a gradient, high at the front, low at the back. It's a maternal effect gene. So that, that lays out the basic orientation of the embryo. And then there were a set of genes uh, for instance, the gap genes that read the concentration of bicoid. Stay on. I don't know why this cuts out on me, but anyway, uh, so you've got the, the gap genes which read the gradient of bicoid and switch on in, in large, broad zones in the embryo. And then after the gap genes have finished reading bicoid, bicoid starts to fade out and is no longer there. You get the, the gap genes turning on in these broad patterns. And then there's a set of genes, the pair rule genes, that turn on in these lovely stripes, like that. So each of these stripes represents a segment. The fly has 14 segments total along its length. And uh, what we're seeing is this alteration, alternation of, here's one pair rule gene like that, and there's another one in the spaces in between. So we build up these pair rule genes 
that make these nice pre-segmental stripes. And how they do that well, that's a little bit complicated, but they are reading the gradient of bicoid, and they're reading the concentration of the gap genes, and between those, that establishes these nice stripey domains. Again, this is not a trivial process. The regulation of these genes is extremely complicated. We haven't talked a lot about gene regulation in this class, but you've heard all about it in cell biology, I presume, uh, where what you've got is these, these regulatory regions that have sequences that are recognized by these transcription factors, like bicoid. So bicoid, we're looking at here at even skipped. It's one of those stripy genes. And it's got sites where bicoid can bind to it. And it's turned on by bicoid in some cases. And we also have repressors that bind to it. And it's all lovely, complicated Boolean logic. You can go in and start teasing apart the bits and pieces of the reg regulatory elements of the genes and try and puzzle out how they read other genes to set up the pattern. And this is, this is another important idea that's coming out of this, is it's not, you know, I called it a hierarchy, but it's not like it's a strict hierarchy where A turns on B, turns on C, turns on D. It's A turns on B and C and D, and then B and C and D have interactions with one another to split up the domains and set up the pattern. So a lot of really nice, complicated signaling going on here. Okay, I think this is about where we left off. So what we can do is we can dissect those regulatory regions. And we can also look at the expression patterns and try and correlate those. So that's what we're seeing here. Here's even skipped again. And uh, this is the length of the animal here. And we're looking at the different segments. So in segment three, even skipped is supposed to be turned on. So it's got a stripe right there. And so that's what you're seeing with this, this, little, this little graph here. So that's the concentration of Eve in this region. And we also saw that there's bicoid, which is in a gradual gradient across the length of the animal. So there's bicoid right there. We also see that here's another one, giant. So that's a gap gene and another gap gene, hunchback, like this. And there's croupal. And just looking at the concentrations of these genes suggests a model that it's that Eve, the regulatory regions of Eve, are turned on by hunchback and bicoid, and they're turned off by giant and croupal. And that's how you get this nice sharp stripe. Now, we're not done, because there's a whole bunch of stripes, right? There's, there's seven stripes down the length of the animal, and each of those stripes is controlled by a slightly different pattern. So those, those regulatory regions, they're, they're pretty complicated, right? They've got lots going on in there. Uh, so you've got this complicated regulatory switch that's saying, okay, you're turned off by giant and croupal when hunchback is high, but back down here, we're gonna make another stripe here, but you're also turned on when croupal is high and hunchback is low. So complicated logic going on there. And it's all defined by this pattern of regulatory, regulatory regions for even skipped. Okay, we also said, I think this is really where we left off. We said, okay, can we test this? Are there ways to test this particular model? And this is an example of the kind of experiment we can do. So in this case, we're looking at Harry. Harry is another pair of row genes. There's a bunch of pair of row genes. So there's not just even skipped and Fushi Terazzo, there's also odd skipped and Harry and a couple of others. 
And we can look at the regulatory region for hairy. That's what we're seeing here. The hairy gene is over here. And these are regulatory regions of the DNA. And we can do these cool experiments where you copy just the little segments of the regulatory region, just a piece at a time. And then you attach it to a, a label, black Z with it out of box. And so if, if we're in a region where this particular regulatory spot is activated, you'll get that stripe. And likewise, this little stripe over here controls a different region of the striping. And there's one for stripe seven, etc. So we just insert these, these probes into our flies and they conveniently light up wherever that region of the regulatory area is activated. So we can, we can dissect the regulations and, and localize where everything is going on. So that's kind of cute. So we've done that for uh, several of these genes and we can work out the complicated nature of the regulation of the individual genes. One of the surprises here is that once upon a time, this was, this was even in my time, People had these ideas that, hey, it's going to be gradients all over the place. There's going to be these lovely gradients that specify the genes. And we all thought, hey, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be elegant and mathematical. Instead, what we find is this kind of brute force approach. Every gene that is involved in these stripes has a regulatory region that is specifically hard-coded to turn the stripes on in particular spots. Those of us who have any background in computer science would say, this is terrible. This is the most inelegant way to solve, to solve the problem ever, but it's how things work. Darn biology, it always, it always turns out more complicated than you expected. Okay, so we can work out all of that. I also told you another way we can do this is look at mutants. So here's another gene mutant experiment. I think this is where we, we had some ideas from you about how to do these experiments, how to interpret these. This is the normal situation. Like I said, there's giant, there's Krupal, there's Eve Stripe 2, there's Hunchback, which turns it on. And so we can do simple experiments like, hey, what if we, what if we mutate it and kill Krupal? Just knock that gene out. And then we look over here, this is what happens. Now, then what happens is the Eve stripe extends its posterior border to follow along with now hunchback. So it's lost a repressor that puts a sharp edge on the back end of the Eve stripe too. Over here we can see we can do dosage experiments. So if we reduce the concentration of Krupal just by making heterozygous for wild-type Krupal and a Krupal mutant, so that's what you see here, the level of Krupal in pink is now lower than in the wild-type. And what you find there is the Eve stripe gets a little broader. So it can stretch out a little bit more this way. This way. And then over here we see, okay, what if we now knock out Giant. Giant is supposed to sharpen the front end of the eave stripe. And yeah, if you knock that out, poof, the eave stripe extends up this way. And then you're saying, oh, why? Why didn't it just go all the way back? It's because there are other genes that are active in here as well. So there's multiple genes controlling the boundaries of expression of each of these pair rule genes. Okay, we also mentioned, oh, no, I do have another experiment to talk about. But I just mentioned it anyway, so this is a little out of order. We'll cope. Uh, yeah, there's also another level of genes. So after the parable genes, you switch on the segment polarity genes. And uh, like it says here, these are active in every segment, not every other segment. Which if you think about it, 
means there's some interesting regulation going on there too. So you've got to have a switch that says, hey, turn yourself on in the stripes with Eve turned on, but also turn yourself on in the stripes with Fushi Teratsu Futs on. Those, those complement each other. So there's got to be something funny going on in their regulation as well. Uh, what the segment polarity genes do is by this time, by the time they're turned on, Bitcoin has started to fade out. It's not as strong as its expression. And so the segments need a good, strong reminder about which way is which. We need to tell them which end is the front end, which end is the back end. It's also going to be used to define other genes that are going to be activated in these, uh, in these organisms. So if you have mutation in a segment polarity gene, the one I mentioned was engrailed, so if you knock out engrailed, you get embryos that have nice segments. But when you look within the segment, that for instance, all the, it's supposed to make bristles that point backwards. You look within the segment, you find bristles pointing every which way. So it gets disordered internally. So there's the engrailed expression. So you've got these nice little bands in every single stripe. And in case you're confused by the picture of the embryo here, uh, this is a little later in embryonic development. This is the head end. And the embryo is too long to stretch out in its egg case. So the embryo extends like this and then curls around. And this is the tail of the, uh, of the abdomen right there. Okay, so we're going to switch on these engrailed chains. They also make these little grooves, so you can physically see the segments even if you don't stay, stain for it. Oh, here's what I should have, I should have shown you earlier. So I told you, okay, there's these parallel genes, and they're, also, they're regulated by things like the gap genes, like giant and crupal and hunchback and all that. But they also interact with each other. So here, for instance, this is, this is Eve here. It's turned on in every other segment, like a good pair of gene. And there's Futs, Fushi Teratsu. It's turned on in the even-numbered segments. So it neatly fits in between those two. How do you think Futs and Eve would interact with each other? Can you make any predictions there? What's the effect of turning on Eve in a patch of the embryo on Futs and vice versa? Just look at the diagram. It should be obvious, right? I look here where Fushi Tratsu is on. Is Eve turned on there? that segment? Nope. It suppresses it. So in addition to all these gap genes sort of defining where things should go, there's some fine-tuning going on where once the, once the parallel genes turn on, they interact with each other and make sure that they've got sharp edges. So Eve and Fushi Trots who do that. Uh, it's a little more complicated because there's multiple pair rule genes. So here's Harry and here's Run. Notice that Harry and Run nicely complement each other, where one's on, the other one is turned off. But also notice it's offset just a little bit from even Futz. So it's like we're going to have these, these stripes that are offset relative to one another. So there's kind of a combinatorial code that can be used. So for example, here we see, okay, Eve and Harry are turned on in the same place, and that's where Engrail is going to be turned on. So with this code, we can define regions within a segment. You get enough pair rule genes, there are more, and you look what you see is these, these nice overlapping domains and you can say, okay, now we're going to have some regulatory elements 
in genes that are downstream that can do things like say, okay, uh, if Eve and Harry are turned on and uh, paired and all that, then we turn on and grilled. And we work out patterns with that kind of method. Another cute thing about this diagram that's not necessarily visible here is this little space right here. How wide is that in the embryo? It's exactly one cell wide. So when you look at the segments of the early embryo, you can find a point when these parallel genes are turning on and this segment is, for instance, exactly, well, I should say exactly, this is biology. It's roughly four cells wide. And the offset of these parallel genes means that each cell in the segment has a unique combinatorial code. It's, it, this part's getting kind of elegant. That's kind of neat to see. But again, it makes the regulation of these genes look pretty complicated. Yeah, when you start digging into the regulation, this is the kind of this is the kind of interaction diagram you come up with. So uh, the blue arrows means it turns on the other gene, and the red arrows mean it turns off the genes. And so Harry and Eve, for instance, are roughly similar in expression, and uh, yeah, they interact and they promote each other. Harry and Runt complement each other and avoid each other. And they suppress each other. Even Futs turn each other off. Even Runt turn off. Oh, yeah, it gets just such a tangled mess, doesn't it? But having all these genetic interactions makes sure that the pattern walks in fairly robustly. And how we determine these things is, well, we start doing mutations and we start knocking out individual genes you start seeing that nice, tidy pa pattern getting disrupted in reasonably predictable ways. Okay, next step. So what we've done with Y so far is we've, we've partitioned it. We set up these, this bicoid gradient, we set up the gap genes that define broad regions, and we use the gap genes and bicoid and each other for the pair rule genes to turn themselves into nice stripes. And then we turn on engrailed within each segment. So every segment's got the same gene turned on for, for once. But what this is code for is making kind of a nondescript segmented worm, right? It's just, it's just a way to make segments over and over again. But as you know from looking at flies in the lab, flies have some pretty complicated morphologies, right? Six legs, an abdomen, a head with an antennae, etc. How do they do that? Uh, that's going to be caused by another category of genes. So we, we've got a hierarchy, remember, we've got maternal effect genes like bitcoin, we've got gap genes, we've got parable genes, we've got segment polarity genes. Next down, downstream of all this are the genes called the selector genes. And these are going to be genes expressed in a way that crosses those nice segments they just set up. And they're called selector genes because they specify regional identities. So you've got a head that's made up of multiple segments. And you've got to tell all those segments, you're part of the head. So there are selector genes that do that. We've got more selector genes that say, okay, this little group of segments over here, you're a thorax, and this group over here, you're an abdomen. So that's why these are called selector genes. But they're also called homeotic genes. Remember, last week I told you about homeotic genes, genes where you get a transformation of one body segment into a different body segment. Okay, remember William Bates, 1894, so we know this, we've known this for a long time. So, selector genes are also called homeotic genes. There are homeotic genes that are not selector genes, 
So the terminology is going to get a little technical. Uh, these are also now called Hox genes. And you've probably heard of Hox genes. They're, they're all the rage in developmental biology. So they're called Hox genes because once the molecular biologists started taking apart these genes, yeah, remember Nusslein Bohard and, and Wieschhaus are very generous, giving people probes and sequences for all these genes. And uh, people start teasing apart, asking, what's, what's the same about these? They found this class of genes, the selector genes, which they called Hox genes, because all of them have a similar motif embedded within them. So the selector genes are all transcription factors, which means these, the proteins, the gene product, is going to bind to DNA and also has other chunks of the protein that interact with others, other proteins in the cell. So we've got a piece of the, of the gene, the gene product, that's going to fit into the grooves of DNA and bind to specific sequences. And the part of the gene that binds to DNA, which is not the totality of the gene, is called the homeobox sequence. Here it is. So all of these selector genes we're going to talk about, they have this. It's a 180 base pair sequence. So that means it's, it's 60 amino acids long. And it's got this specific structure. It's got a helix, a helix, a helix. And those helices fold in characteristic ways and they fold and they have the right dimensions so they nice, nicely fit into the grooves of the DNA molecule. So this is going to glom on to DNA. And when we started sequencing these, so here for instance is a canonical amino acid sequence. So we've got a bunch of amino acids here. Should be 60 of them. You don't have to count them, but there's 60 of them in here. And you start looking at other of these selector genes, these Hox genes, and you find, for instance, here's one uh, that's pretty much the same, isn't it? But there might be little differences. And so if you look at another one, you might see this sequence. Again, it's, it's pretty similar. There are some things that are identical, like this leucine sitting right there, uh, and I don't remember what W and F are, but yeah, you get these amino acids that fit in here that they're the same all the time. The others show variation to different degrees. But again, remember thinking back to cell biology, there are some amino acids that are hydrophilic and others that are hydrophobic and others that are, and there's polar ones and all that kind of stuff. Um, they, they have some consistent patterns here. So what we find is we have this recognizable structure in all of these genes, and that got called a homeobox sequence. As we're seeing right there. So that's the homeobox. That's, that's the part that binds to DNA. There are also other parts of this protein that were not shown here. So Hox genes are more than just the Hox sequence. There's lots of other amino acids. And those are doing busy, important things and in interacting with other genes and gene products in the cell. Okay. Now, this is, I told you the terminology is going to get a little twisty here. Okay, selector genes refer specifically to these genes in the fly and their role in specifying regions of the animal. Then we had uh, the homeobox containing genes. So we had these genes that have that 180 base pair sequence. So those are all homeobox genes. So these are all Hox genes. There is another level of complexity here though. There are also things called members of the homeotic complex. Huh. So what we find is when we look at these genes in, in, the, in the chromosome itself, 
we discover that they're a linked collection of closely associated Hox genes. And that they're actually, they actually exhibit a property called collinearity. So what does that mean? That means we're going to see a whole bunch of Hox genes, genes that specify the identity of regions of the organism, and they're all in the same place. They're all tied together on the chromosome. And further, the collinearity refers to the fact that the order of the genes on the chromosome reflects the order of the expression patterns in the organism. So what does that mean? So it means we find, a, we find a, a gene on the left over here. And if we imagine our fly facing that way, that gene is turned on in the head. We go back a little further to the right, and there's a gene there. It's turned on just behind the first gene, etc. So we can actually so we can actually see the patterns of expression in the body, and it's in the same order. It's collinear with the order of the genes on the chromosome. Now that's pretty cool. That's that was a hint that maybe, maybe this is a place where we can find basically the blueprint for the organism. Here's, here's where the pieces are laid out by these Hox genes. Uh, it turns out to be more complicated than that. That's not entirely true. But here's a simplified diagram of that, and I'll explain why it, it didn't quite work. Uh, so here we have labial at the very front. Labial, that refers to mouth parts. Then we have proboscidea, proboscis, that tongue that you've seen in the lab. Uh, that's, that's where this gene is expressed. Deformed doesn't tell you much, but yeah, that's an anterior gene. Uh, sex combs reduced. Where do you think that gene is expressed? What leg do you see sex cones on? You guys are looking at these all the time in the lab, right? The sex cone? Which leg has the sex cones? Front ones. Front ones, yeah. So this is going to be expressed in the forelimbs. Then we have Antennapedia behind that. Uh, Antennapedia gets its name. That's the one where if it's misexpressed, you can turn on leg formation in the head. So we've got extra expression there. Uh, then we find ultrabiothorax. Uh, that's posterior thorax. Abdominal A and abdominal B. I guess we got a lot of got tired of coming up with creative names for them. And so they're all in a nice tidy order. Now I told you the collinearity is is something about maybe that leaves out the pattern of the animal. Uh, see that little squiggle right there? It's broken. The, the Hox sequence, the collinear Hox sequence in flies is actually broken and put into two pieces of two different chromosomes. Darn, there goes that simple idea. Furthermore, what we find is when we look at other organisms that have this, that have this collinear Hox sequence, uh, they, they are sometimes broken up in different ways. And there are some organisms that have all the Hox genes. I'm jumping ahead of myself. They have all the Hox genes, but they're completely scrambled. They're all over the place. So we think there is some regulatory... Stay on. Come on. There's some regulatory mechanism that uh, turns on the genes sequentially during development but that in other organisms, and probably in the fly as well, they've also developed supplementary regulatory mechanisms to turn them on in different patterns. So yeah, it's going to get complicated. Uh, Hox gene regulation is a really interesting but very messy area of genetic research. OK, oh, let me go back a minute. So, I told you there's these genes here, UBX in particular, 
These are interesting because they affect that pattern I mentioned earlier. So we've got these genes associated with these. Uh, some of these are not genes themselves, but actually change modifications to regulation. So here's the wild type pattern. This is what the second thoracic segment and the third thoracic segment of the fly are supposed to look at, look like. You got the wings up there, those are obvious. Some of you know, have noticed the little halteres, those cute little, the little buttons that are on the back end of the thorax, and those are uh, gyroscopes. When the fly is flying, they just kind of spin around and it allows the animal to detect its orientation. So that's what you're supposed to look like. On the other hand, if you have a mutation in bithorax, just one mutation in bithorax, you get this effect, where this is diagrammatic. When you look at these, the wings are crumbled, they're kind of crumbled, because you're making the front half of the halter turn into a wing, and the posterior half stays halter, and so you get this kind of unholy amalgam of wing and halter, and it's just kind of curled around. But uh, diagrammatically, that's what it is. Front half turns into a front half of a wing, back half stays halter. There's another gene called post bithorax, which does the reverse, turns the posterior half of the halter into a wing, and the anterior half stays a halt here. Again, it looks horrible, distorted, crumpled little blob there on the, on the thorax. There is also a fun mutation here called halt here mimic, which transforms the wing into a halt here. So this poor fly has no wings, but it does have two halt ears, which doesn't help it at all. You need the halt ears for flying. Okay, for maintaining orientation. Uh, we can also demonstrate that. I don't recommend this, it's, it's a cruel experiment, but if you go in with scissors and you snip off the halteres, and then try and see what happens when the fly flies. Oh, that poor fly, he will just kind of bumble around. It can barely fly. Uh, it can't direct itself. It gets very confused, it gets very dizzy, and crashes into the ground. Yes, it's cruel, but I've done it. Anyway. So, halteers are, are essential for flight, and if you don't have wings, you don't fly. Another fun thing we can do, what if we combine these? We've got a double mutant, bithorax and post-bithorax. Cross those together, what do you get? You get this fly I showed you before, where now it's got two sets of wings on each side. So we get a complete transformation of the halter into a wing. Now you guys have been looking at flies a lot lately, right? You can probably recognize these bristles. You know, you got those nice long bristles at the posterior end of the thorax. You've probably seen these. They kind of cross often like that. So there's a bristle, there's a bristle. Uh, you get a duplication of the whole thorax. It's not just the wings. So there you see those bristles again. Nice cross bristles. Uh, once again, this is a complicated, a complicated cross to do, a complicated experiment to render. Uh, and a lot of the flies come out with partial transformations. And they're not as pretty as this one. This is a spectacularly thorough uh, duplication of two thoracic segments. So we can do that with Hox genes. Now, as I said, these genes are collinear, that is, they get this order on the chromosome, and they've also got this order of expression in the embryo. So there's labial, then deformed, then sex cones, then antennapedia, then UBX, then abdominal A and abdominal B. Again, remember the embryo curls around like this. So we can see that with the right kinds of probes, probes specifically designed to label each of these, these different molecules with a different colored chromophore on their surface, you can get these beautiful Easter egg sort of pictures of flies, fly embryos. Which just shows how distinctly, how distinctly these patterns are expressed. 
in the embryo. And we can use those to map out the organization in, in the fly. So, yeah, you often see these pretty colored photos where you color the gene on, on the chromosome. That's what we see laid out here. And then you color the regions it affects in the same color on the fly. You can see these patterns emerge quite readily. So, yeah, like there's ultrabithorax. There's the whole tear. There's the posterior limb. Here, uh, here is sex cones reduced in green. There is the front leg, which has the sex cones. You can just lay that out very nicely. Okay. And you're all saying, okay, flies, enough with flies. We spent the whole semester looking at flies. Can you tell us something relevant? Uh, yeah, I can. So this is a really cool result. Like I said, Newsom, Philhart, and Bishops were very generous with sending out these probes all over the place. And you could just you could just call them up, send them a postcard. Next thing you know, you have these little vials with uh, labeled probes in them, or you can get a, get back with the sequence information of the gene, etc. And uh, then there was this wonderful cottage industry of Oh, 1990s were a hotbed for this. There were so many papers published where people just said, okay, I rode off to Newsline Volhard and I got the probes for ultrabithorax. And then I stained a beetle or I stained an opossum or I stained a cow, whatever. And here's the expression pattern. And what was found is that these genes are shared. So, again, there's, there's that collinear sequence in the fruit fly with all these genes lined up here. And lo and behold, some of the most exciting stuff was uh, people who work on mice, for instance, got these, these probes. Some of us who worked on zebrafish at the time got some. I got some genes and a colleague and I stained up zebrafish and oh wow, it works. You discover that they have the same homologous genes lined up along the length of the animal. There were some significant differences. One difference is, oh look, here's, here's the genes involved in flies. Here we are in a mouse. And there's these other genes back here. What are those associated with? Uh, they're associated with a structure that flies don't have. They're expressed in the tail, which sort of makes sense, right? So you get this nice pattern of genes turned on in stripes along the length of the animal, and then you get to these weird animals, these chordates, that have tails that go on longer, and they've got a new set of Hox genes that get turned on there. Um, these Hox genes back here are duplicates out of these other posterior genes. Which again makes sense. So we've got a gene duplication, creates new information, it can be read and used by the organisms to specify regions of this post-anal tail that we've all got. So there's that's one difference. Uh, in this sequence, for instance, you know there's some, something missing. Oh, we've got a gap in here. But what they found is that also we got duplications of the whole set of Hox genes. So this is on chromosome six. This is Hox A. And uh, we got chromosome 11 has another copy. It doesn't have the tail ones though, does it? Uh, this one's on chromosome 11. This is Hox B. And then over here's Hox C. It's got all these Hox genes. It's lacking the anterior most ones. And then here's Hox D. Again, it's got the whole sequence, but now it's missing a chunk in the middle. So we've got these different combinations of Hox genes. So if you look in your tissues as an embryo, of course, and you say, okay, I'm gonna look, I'm gonna look right here in, in the cervical region of an embryo, and what you'll find is there, there you find these genes there, this combination of genes.
So it's, again, a combinatorial code that defines a specific identity of each segment of the animal. Uh, over here, we can also work out the evolutionary origins of this. So here's, here's a mammal. Here's Amphioxus. You all saw lancelets when you were in diversity, I presume? Yeah, those guys. Uh, they've also got the collinear Hox sequence, but they only have one copy. We've got four, they've got one. We must be better. No, that's what that works. Uh, here's a beetle, it's got one copy. Here's a nematode. Notice with a the nematode, they also have a collinear sequence, but there's only four genes in it. So apparently there's been some increase in the number of Hox genes over evolutionary time. And here's Hydra. Again, you've seen Hydra. With all those, those cute little gooey gelatinous things with the tentacles at the end. They only have two. And that's enough to specify the hold fast and where the tentacles are made. So I got some positional information there. And when we look at this, this whole sequence, we can see there's been a progressive increase in the complexity of the collinear Hox sequence in various organisms. This diagram is really incomplete because uh, if we had a branch over here with tunicates, who remembers tunicates from biodiversity? Anyone? Sea squirts? Oh man, it's, this is Minnesota. You gotta live on the coast to get familiar with sea squirts. Uh, sea squirts are these little blobby things that attach to pilings and rocks along the seashore. Uh, they're filter feeders, but they start out as little tadpoles. They swim around and then they, after they've dispersed, they stick themselves down to a nearby surface and they throw away their brain and they compress and they turn into these little things that just suck in water and spit it back out. Uh, when you look at tunicates, which are, would be down here in this branching diagram, uh, they have thrown away all the organization of the Hox genes as well. So they don't look like this anymore. They've got all the Hox genes, but they're just scattered around on different chromosomes. So, but, so it's, it's more complicated than just a linear march of progress. There's lots of stuff going on in here. Uh, this is part of the evidence, though, that in the origin of chordates, that is us, there were two whole genome duplication events. Remember I told you, 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 you don't survive that? If you have a duplication of the whole genome, so you have two copies, if you're, if you're polyploid, not, you don't make it. Uh, that is not true for some organisms, things like amphibians and many fish. So we think that they had gene duplications, whole genome duplications, and ancestral fish, and that's why we've got all these copies here. Okay, now this leads to some ideas, some potential experiments. And one is an answer to the question everybody had. Okay, we got fly mutants that can duplicate or modify the pattern of the segments. So we have mutants where you can put a leg on the head end of the fly, right? Why don't we have anything cool like that in vertebrates? Why don't we have people who are born with transformations that, for instance, give them six limbs? That would be awesome. Probably fatal, but kind of cool anyway. Uh, so we got all these possible transformations. They don't occur. We don't get homeotic mutations in humans, you might say. There's, there's some cases where it's kind of close to that. And why don't we? Because we've got all this redundancy. Yeah, you, it's really hard to do a homeotic transformation if you want to change this region of the embryo, where you've got two Hox genes, into a posterior region you got to turn on a whole bunch of genes and turn off a whole bunch of genes all at the same time. It's really unlikely to happen. 
Yeah, so don't worry, you're, you're never going to have kids with antennae growing out of their heads. It just doesn't, doesn't happen in vertebrates. At least not unless you do it intentionally. We can do experiments where we intentionally modify those. So here to give you a little foundation on that, uh, what we see here is the segments in a mouse and a chick, in a bird and a mammal. And you know, we are segmented, right? Look at your backbone, you've got all these segments going back, back and back into your tails. We can count these segments and we can compare them between a chick and a mouse. So here we just line up the chick and the mouse segments. And this, for instance, is cervical one. So your, your topmost cervical vertebra. Who is taking anatomy right now? Anyone? Or has taken anatomy? Yeah, a few of you, okay. Yeah, see, so, you know, there's, there's um, what is it, atlas? Atlas and, and axis, some of the two top ones. Yeah, atlas and axis. Uh, we call them C1 and C2 here. But it's, it's the same, same idea. You get identities for each of these vertebral segments. So here's C1. And we can look at the expression pattern of the Hox genes. So up here we got B4, D4, A4, and C4. So B, C, and D, those groups of Hox genes are turned on here. And when we look in the bird, we, in the mammal, we can see that the same genes are turned on to define the identity of those. But mammals have really short necks in terms of the number of vertebrae. There's only seven vertebrae involved up here. Birds can have much longer necks. So here we got this long-necked bird, this short-necked mammal, and you say, they don't line up. We don't have the same number of segments. However, when you look at the Hox genes, look at the pattern here. It's the same pattern. It's just that in birds, it stretches out over a longer number of segments. So this is, this is you could think of this as the code right here that specifies cervical vertebrae. Turn on these genes, that's where you make cervical vertebrae. Of course, one of the hallmarks of cervical vertebrae is they don't have ribs. You go back into the thoracic region, and look, we've got ribs hanging off of all our vertebrae there, so they're easy to di differentiate morphologically. And then we look here, that's the darker blue, so these are the thoracic regions. And notice our bird has a shorter thoracic region, has fewer ribs. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six there. And then we got our thoracic region in the mammal, and it's got, it's got more, what is it, eight or nine here. So we've got a bunch of thoracic vertebrae. And when you look at the code, the Hox code, it's the same in birds and mammals. In this case, it's just the mammalian expression is stretched out a little further. And then we have the lumbar region, no ribs here. Uh, we got the sacral lip region, that's where the bones tend to get fused. And then we got the tail region, the caudal region. But they all share the same Hox code, which is kind of neat. So we can use the Hox code to see where is the boundary between where you make these different structures. In particular, one question we ask is, can we, can we determine where you're going to make arms and legs? Because that's another feature of the pattern that's kind of important, right? You all put your arms up here, hanging off your shoulders, and not down here, hanging off your belly button. How does the embryo know to do that? How does it know the pattern it's supposed to use? Uh, well, the tissues that are going to make up the limbs read the Hox gene pattern. So that's how that works. All right, so we can do experiments, though. Uh, we can poke around and do some simple experiments here. This is just a simple one at first. Uh, here we're looking at the 13th thoracic vertebra. Here we're looking at the first lumbar vertebra. You can see the difference is thoracic have ribs lumbar doesn't, right? You poke around here. No, no ribs are supposed to be down here. If you make a mutation, if you knock out Hox C8, 
and ask what happens. Well, this first lumbar vertebrae transforms and now it becomes a thoracic vertebra and grows out ribs. So we can manipulate that code, that longitudinal code and affect what grows where. Uh, this is a more complicated set of experiments. Uh, since then we have been accumulating all kinds of mutations in these. And most of these mutations don't do drastic, obvious things. Again, because of all that redundancy, you get all these duplicate Hox genes that can fill in the gap. Uh, it's, it's really rare to find anything that we could clearly call a homeotic mutation, because you often have to mutate a couple of genes to get that. And what you see here is, okay, there's C1, C2, etc. through C7, there's our cervical vertebrae, no ribs. Here's our thoracic vertebrae with their ribs. Uh, this is the uh, sternum. And it's just drawn twice because they graphically fold out the ribs. And so there's, there's a sternum hanging out there. Uh, and then we get down into the lumbar vertebrae here and the sacral and the tail. And what you see here on the right, this is the control. This, these are animals without mutations. And you can just take cross sections through here. So for instance, we slice through C2. This is the embryonic shape of the vertebra. C7, right here, looks like that. And uh, again, through T1, T7, L1, S1, etc. We look at the morphology here. And then what you see on the left is mutations. If we knock out Hox5, we get a transformation of this in a subtle way. It looks different. It's anatomically weird. That's all we can say about it. Here, for instance, uh, this is T1. We can make Hox6 mutations and Hox5 mutations. And now T1 thinks it's a cervical vertebra. And so it doesn't make ribs. So like you say, there's a kind of code, a pattern, and when you manipulate that code, you manipulate the identity of body structures. And here down here, this is a lumbar one. Again, we can make it sprout ribs just by modifying these, these little genes. Um, Hox10, same thing, here's a primitive sort of uh, limb, a rib growing off of it. Uh, lots of games you can play with this. Now, as I said, you do this to mice, and often it's not really obvious until you dissect the mouse because there is so much redundancy here. Uh, there have been some uh, reports that there may be some mutations in humans. But in particular, uh, it's been observed that there are mutations, homeotic transformations of the hindbrain that produce duplicated neural segments. And again, it's subtle. There has been a weak correlation between that, though, and autism. So some autistic people may have a transformation of regions of their brain into a slightly different region. Not all autistic people. Autism is so complicated, it's beyond the scope of this class, but there it is. Uh, lots of these experiments have been done so again, this is a diagram similar to that one, uh, only they're showing, okay, rib transformations, uh, lumbar transformations, all of these worked out by changing that code, that spatial code that identifies the different regions of the organism. And we can actually map these out. So remember, just as in flies, flies is it okay, there's, there's a collinear sequential code you know, labial deforms, sex comes reduced, etc., in order. In vertebrates, we can see a similar sort of arrangement where there's a sequential expression of the Hox genes, but notice it's also more complicated. Uh, in vertebrates, we tend to have a lot more overlap. In insects, it tends to be sharp boundaries abutting each other. Uh, in vertebrates, no, there's a lot of overlap. 
Uh, further not shown here is that many of these Hox genes in vertebrates have strong expression, for instance, if we just look at Hox5 here, it's got strong expression up here, weaker expression here, and then it kind of dribbles off, just really faint light expression, so that even posterior segments could possibly, potentially, read the concentration of Hox5 back here. We don't know. We haven't done enough experiments to figure it all out. Uh, but as you can see, there's also overlap. Like here's Hox10 and Hox9. Hox10 is overlapping with 9 and 11. So we've got complications going on. But these are homologous to the fly genes. That's also another key point. It is that we have inherited this, this code, this pattern for identifying regions of the animal from flies, well, fly ancestors, our last common ancestor of flies and vertebrates, and we use this now in our body plan. Using that kind of information, we can put together a hypothetical evolutionary ancestor that we're seeing here. So what's going on here is we, we look at all these different organisms. We look at flies, we look at mice, we look at everything we can find, sea squirts, whatever. <clears throat> and among the things we learn is that there are some genes that are held in common in all these organisms. So for example, flies, people, mice, fish, everything, is gonna, are going to make ice, ice spots. Not necessarily full eyes, but they'll make a little sensory structure at their interior hand. And, and that eye structure is always specified by a gene called PAC6. Okay, so it's a master gene to switch on eye development. And it's present in flies in us. And it does the same thing in flies in us. That tells you the last common ancestor of flies and people probably had PAC6. And we work it all the way back and say, okay, if we go back to the early Cambrian, maybe even the pre-Cambrian, we can say that there was an organism that had PAC6 and made an eye spot. We could also say, oh, it had, uh, it had this gene, NKX2.5. NKX2.5 is called Tin Man in fruit fly. I think that's a much prettier name. It comes from the Wizard of Oz, obviously, right? Yeah, you don't make a heart if you have a defect in NKX2.5. Uh, so we all share this gene, this master gene that switches on the heart. So this last common ancestor probably had a, a homolog of NKX2.5. Uh, we also find that there's these domains like the bone morphogenetic protein domain that specifies dorsal. So that was probably there. Our muscles are switched on by a gene called myoD. That's shared with flies and people. So using this kind of information, we can, in, we can interpret it to speculate what the last common ancestor of flies and people look like. And it probably looked like a, a bit like this. It's got an eye spot, it's got, it's got a heart, it's got muscles, it's got a gut, uh, it's got an anus, it's got a top and a bottom that are defined by certain molecules, certain common molecules, it's got a mouth. It was probably very worm-like. It was probably very tiny. But we can put together stories like this about where all these structures came from. Okay, it is time for us to quit. Time for me to go get a booster shot, too. So, uh, we'll see you tomorrow, some of you, in lab. Take a look at the assignment, see if there's any questions you have about it. Feel free to ask about that as well.